Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Joan, for the, the introduction. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm Neil Kerry. I'm going to speak here about the Transpennine Route Upgrade Programme. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I, I'm, I'm going to just recap and build on, on what Tim just said, really, about the, the, the purpose of the TRU programme. So, kind of and answering the, the why, why are we doing TRU? talk about the development of TRU and how we've overcome some of the challenges, <coughs> update you on where we go next, and, uh, and kind of share some of the, the lessons learned with you. Uh, but before I start, kind of, wh when you come to, to an event like this and you get asked to write your, a synopsis of, of your career, uh, mine was quite rushed and didn't give Joan a lot of material to work with, it, so <laughs> sorry Joan. Uh, but can you, you reflect back, and you know, I joined as a, a management trainee in the British Rail Training Scheme. And I, I think back to the time that I joined, and I was sent to the Morpeth Track Maintenance Area. And uh, I was introduced to a chap called Sean Fugel, and Sean was the PWME up there, and also Richard Thornton was the, the head, of, head of civils. And th those two guys and the, the other characters that I met in that time gave me a great lift in my career and I think the start that we all get to our career sets the tone for the rest of your experience and it sets the tone for your experience of the industry it sets the tone for the experience of the company that you work for and I, I reflect back there and uh, I was handed a 1979 print version of Railway Track from the Permanent Way Institute so I'm probably due an upgrade because that's still the book that I, ch I cherish and uh, refer back to. But, but for me, you know, that, that gave me a great start. I really, I really poured over that, that book. I knew nothing about track when I, I was a proper green management trainee. Everybody liked to take the mickey and see if I could carry a sleeper and kind of all, you know, all those things that nobody should try to do today at all. But I think there's a responsibility there for all of us. So just to reflect, whatever level we reach in our career, I think our responsibility is to send the elevator, send the lift back down again and bring the next person up. And the challenge for us all, reflect on how we do that. And I think it's also important we reflect how we do that on an inclusive and diverse basis. So challenge ourselves. Let's, let's look after the next generation. Let's use these projects that we talk about today as an opportunity to do that and the legacy that we, that we leave. So, I shall move on. So, in terms of TRU, uh, I've done a lot with Jacobs over so the last 25 years. Jacobs do rail projects around the world, heavy rail, light rail. We get opportunities to be involved in, in non-rail infrastructure programs as part of our transportation group. And all of that's been, been great. I've had a great career, and uh, that was the still think back, that was the, the best day of my life when, when I got the offer from British Rail to come and join this industry. Uh, but I would say my proudest moment is actually here and, and now and, and quite present. So working on the Transpennine route upgrade, it's great people involved and apologies if your particular company is not listed, listed up there, but you kind of, you, you, you're all acknowledged. But a huge collection of, of of, of colleagues from around the rail industry working together. And uh, a great technical challenge, so lots to get our, get our teeth into. And also a challenge in terms of, of getting funding together and making progress in, in what is, has been quite a changing environment in terms of, of requirements. But then also the legacy that we leave. I think in all of my, my, my time in, in projects and, and programme delivery, this is a real unique opportunity to make a difference. And that's not just for the legacy that we leave at the end, but it's the legacy we create whilst we're building. So the real social and economic benefits as we go. We're quite proud about the number of people we're getting in who've been long-term unemployed. Uh, we've been getting people through STEM. We've been recruiting uh, through um, internships and graduate training programs and already seeing those coming back and adding value. So that, that just makes me really proud and something I hope to be con continue with as, as we progress. So lots of the people up there uh, I do owe some thanks to for the information within the presentation and you will recognise those bits as we come to, bit, if, if, if we come to it um, as we go. So thank you in advance. 
So this is quite narrowing down the focus from Tim's wider NPR perspective. My, my region of interest starts just five yards out of Victoria Station and it, start, it ends five yards short of York. So that's our main area of interest across the Trans-Pennine route. Most of you uh, here today have maybe travelled on it to get here and kind of know, know the route pretty well. So it, it experienced great success in passenger growth over the years approaching COVID up to 50 million journeys per year. It, it really struggled though because, because of the capacity demands on it. Only 38% of trains were turning up on time uh, pre-COVID. Getting a seat was quite difficult. And that's all because we were asking so much out of the route as a mixed use route using freight, using fast uh, intercity journeys, tr mixing it in with stopping services, stopping at Mosley and Staley Bridge. And it, 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 that's another £10, isn't it? That's, we're doing quite well. Um, and of course, uh, the TRU programme, you know, there, there are people in this room that were working on TRU 20 years ago and, dare I say it, maybe 30 years ago. And since then, this, this has hung over the, the, the route like a cloud because investment in the route has been held back waiting for this big enhancement programme to come and fix things. So the rail is old. The signalling system is old with a mixture of, uh, of old route relay interlocking systems and first generation CBI. And this has all been, uh, the maintenance team do a fantastic job on keeping this going but it, it's not sustainable for another 20 years. So without the enhancement, there's still a lot of work to do if you want to keep a railway open. Okay, so this, <coughs> building on what Tim talks about, so the, 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 same, the same numbers, so TRU isn't an infrastructure project, it's a project about creating more value for the north of England. And, it, and we do, against any benchmark, against European benchmarks, we're, we're a poor performer in terms of productivity. When you look at the why, we, in terms of what's considered a good uh, level of transport or people travelling to different places of employment, we're 60% behind what is considered a good level of connectivity. Now, you can't fix it. Like London is a great economic hub, but London can't fix the whole of the UK. It would have to grow by over 70% if we were going to look for the solution in London. So that's why it becomes really important that as the north, we, we can solve some of these connectivity issues and put our share back into the, into the whole UK economy. So I, as, a cover, as I cover here, pre-COVID, if you were maybe one of the 15% who would be stood, at, stood on a train, road was also congest, congested. So people didn't really have another choice. So that, all of that was holding back our economic growth. And of course, freight, no real alternatives. So thousands of of uh, freight lorries on the M62 every day. So transport can be a solution to that, that economic um, belt that, that we've got around us. And there are a number of, of areas that we can influence so we can make journeys quicker, we can improve con connectivity from one to another, make, a, make the journey more attractive by having reliability and how that service will arrive at its destination, and make the whole journey a pleasant experience, a safe experience, and something that, we, that attracts us to it. So, you know, a good retail experience, good parking, electric charging points to park your electric car uh, as, 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 you, as you look to get onto the station. So we can do all of those things. And for the TRU aspirations, we want to reduce the journey time. We want more trains per hour. Similar to, as Tim said, we want a regular clock service timetable almost getting to that forget the timetable, you can turn up and you're never that far away from a train across the Pennines. We want to be on time and we want to be part of the sustainable journey in terms of having, having an electric rolling stock moving away from diesel. And I'll talk a, a little bit more about our contribution to sustainability as, as we go. So I'll talk about how, how we've done the development. Uh, I think one of the the allegations placed against TRU is that you're a, uh, a project spent its life on PowerPoints. So lots of presentations, lots of discussions about what you might do, but no real action. I'll talk about why that isn't true later on, but I, what I will tell you about the challenges that we've we faced. 
So we've, we've looked to develop TRU as a whole system. So not focused on infrastructure, but within this development triangle, there's a sweet spot <laughs> that we've aspired to find in the TRU development. And you see each of those factors pulls you in a slightly different direction, depending which perspective that you look at the problem from. So the timetable, everybody wants more trains, the train operators want more trains. Everybody wants to stop at every station, but everybody wants to go super fast between. The freight community want lots of freight trains. Uh, they never want the railway closing for maintenance. So from a timetable perspective, you have all of those different aspirations. And then of course the rolling stock issues. Do you have bi-modes? Do you have electric trains? Do you have battery trains? Hydrogen trains, anybody? And yeah, these, you, you're dealing with probably there, the, the technology is moving faster in that sector than, than anywhere else. And then infrastructure. So what, what are you prepared to build? How long do you want to wait until it's, until it's there? Lots of these tensions have, have led us to around find, finding that sweet spot. Now, all of that is complicated enough, but I've, you've got this, you've got a gravitational draw of the pound signs, which, which can throw that sweet spot off center. And now, what I haven't put up there maybe is quite appropriate, given what's happening in Manchester. The political influence is probably just as great and is just as likely to pull it in a different, different direction. But we've made good progress. We are now heading towards our final business case submission. We think we've found the solution. Now, I've put this here, and, and it was good to hear John talk earlier about railways as a, as a system. Uh, so a small graphic here in terms of, of, of simply expressing to, uh, if you know TRU well, it's simply expressing to somebody who might have spent a career building um, aircraft carriers, what, what the high level railway system looks like. And you can see that projects kind of get a nominal motion, uh, mention at the bottom, and, that, and that's probably fair. In the lifespan of a project or a railway system, a project's, a, a project's influence is actually quite small. So it, most of it, operation, maintenance, longer term renewals, are far more significant to get all of those right if you really want to realise the benefits. You can build something and see no benefit from it. <clears throat> so the only way to manage that, really, is, is through a system engineering approach. So to get some real robust process around things, unfortunately. And I'm not the greatest fan of process, for those who know me, but sometimes it's, it's necessary. What we've created for TRU is... is I, th I think we've, we've led the way in how we've under worked with the DFT to really understand the client development agreement. So in terms of that top level, what we want that railway enterprise to deliver after TRU. That's not been easy. That's, there's a lot, of, a lot of work with the client, a lot of education around what an output is versus don't tell us what to build, tell us what output you want to achieve. And we've kept that focus in terms of concept of ops and maintenance. So the, the operations and maintenance community, again, don't tell us what you want to build. Don't tell us that you want bi-directional signalling. Tell us how you actually want to operate and run the railway. We flow that, flow that all the way down and we end up with the three streams. And for each of those streams, operator maintenance and infrastructure, we now have a set of output requirements that we can work with. And those of you who work on the TRU program will know from an infrastructure perspective. We then give those to each of our pro projects. And again, we don't tell them what to build. We tell the, the project what the problem statement is. And that allows us to use the innovation in the supply chain who can work out the right technical solution to deliver those outputs. And then my job, uh, in the, and the technical design authority's job, is to make sure when everybody does those projects, and there are hundreds in the whole railway enterprise, that we can go back to the DFT and give some sound confidence that uh, their, their outputs will be met and their investment will pay off. Right, so with all of that, I'll tell you where we've currently got to in this, this trade-off of so many things. <coughs> So our route starts in Manchester, Victoria, and the key principle of the TRU 
outputs is that we want four fast trains leaving Victoria every 15 minutes. Now, the, these will be electric trains. So we're in the first of our projects now, W1 project. So W1 is part of our TRU West alliance. So we've had an alliance in place now for, for quite a few years who've been doing the early development. Uh, that's Amy, Bam and Arabs. And they're, looking, they're coming out of Victoria to electrify it and increase line speeds. And you'll see the most notable there, Miles Platting Junction. Now, our timetable, as we come out of Victoria, we have two semi-fast trains which leave Piccadilly, uh, as well as two stopping services which have left Victoria. So, threading them all together, our first point of conflict is at Staley Bridge. So, Staley Bridge, and I've left this in deliberately, this was an early concept scheme for Staley Bridge, where we're looking at providing that capacity where the, the two services come together, meant putting in a, in a new bypass line on the top side there, and a new viaduct. But part of that trade-off is the infrastructure, the cost, and finding the sweet spot. What we were able to do there was eliminate that new bypass line with a very minor compromise to the timetabling performance. So that saved us over £100 million, uh, which was important as we kept going. So this will move quite quickly. So the bit as we now approach into Huddersfield... We've now entered ETCS land for TRU, so we'll be running generally signals away ETCS as our end state. That does mean having a conventional stage in there before, before we get there. But now we've got all of our train services running together, and the first place that we need to increase capacity is through Huddersfield Station. So we put four through platforms in now, and we take those four tracks all the way through now to Ravensthorpe. This video is taken from our TWAO consultation process, which is, which is currently underway. We just passed Hill House sidings, and, and there we, we're looking to replicate the stabling facilities which are currently at Huddersfield, and of course we lose when we go forward and, and build the new platforms. So that, that's there as a, a new permanent facility for the train operators. As we go through on the new four-track formation, we've now got that all-important overtaking capacity. Now, our, we have our fast trains, the semi-fast trains, and the stopping services, which are going between Manchester and Leeds. This eight-mile section in the middle is where they all have to pass each other, and they all have to pass the trains which are doing exactly the same, going from Leeds to Manchester. So it's often described as the eye of the needle for the Transpennine route. This is our most significant investment on the TRU programme as a single project. So we know it as W3. It's currently heading towards its, its AIP development, so it's, it's well, well progressed. This is probably one of our... We've, our remit originally with the DFT was to, to do the TransPennine up, upgrade and stay within the boundaries and offer, squeeze, squeeze as many pips out of the TRU route as we could. And that's generally what we, what we did achieve. I'd say this is one of the few exceptions where we do go outside of the land boundary, so to create a 100 mile an hour alignment. Uh, we've, uh, we, we have gone outside of the boundary, but that, that was important in terms of its location and maintaining the, the, the line speed profile in a consistent way. Some of the areas that, that we, have, we have passed uh, you'll see that there's, there's st new stations, new facilities. As I've mentioned, that's DDA compliance. It's, it's making the stations a more pleasant place to, to visit. And as we come here, we've now got freight services which have joined the slow lines in blue. We've now got Bradford to London services that, which have joined, joined the line. So we, we're getting increasingly, increasingly busy in this section of track. So in terms of our outputs, then, and, and I mentioned the requirements flow down. We, we gave our W3 team, so the Amy Bam Arab Alliance, a specification. It never said build four tracks. It gave a, a, an aspiration for journey time. It gave an aspiration for the level of capacity that they, sh should, they should provide. And what they did around that, a number of iterations, and you can imagine how many iterations you can get of something this big. You know, do you have the fast lines on the north, the south, in the middle? And, and those were worked through in, in quite some detail. And I was quite, quite proud, really, of, of how we managed to sift out so many options 
and get to a point which is, is, is broadly supported by stakeholders now. The most significant intervention is here in terms of getting those freight, the, the, the freight traffic away uh, down here towards Wakefield whilst we maintain uninterrupted passenger services going towards Ravensthorpe. And we drop down here from our four tracks heading in towards uh, Dewsbury. You'll see we just narrow into our two tracks back to the existing formation and uh, ahead to, to Dewsbury. So what I'll say is that that, as our video continues, so we, we now, so it's still here, we're ETCS, we do retain some signals for local services which, which, won't, which won't have ETCS cab fitment. And we, we drop down into the, the Dewsbury uh, towards Leeds project, which is uh, our W4 project. Again, fully electrifying. We're dealing with get, getting those wires through Morley Tunnel. And I would say, through, through all of the electrification, the, what, what we've aimed to do, it's not a big part of the TRU cost. Most of our cost is in providing the capacity. So it's not an electrification project per se, but it's important. The reason it's important is because if we prove we can deliver electrification in a value for money way, we support the long-term long -term electrification as a, a way of decarbonising transport. On the counter, if we can't prove that it works for TRU, then that might see it taken off the agenda altogether. So we're working very hard uh, with some of the people in this room to, to make, make that so. We've seen 30% reduction from where we were in CP5 and the start of CP6. We've still got further, further to go um, in terms of eliminating bridge over bridge construction for electrification, for example, reducing the, the depth of, for, uh, of foundations uh, for OLE structures. And that's all important as we, as we get through towards, towards Leeds. But we've passed Morley on the way and uh, that, again, a station move. And what seems quite an innocuous station move actually frees up capacity. It gets rid of some very awkward tunnel controls for the way that trains can work on capacity. So, it's, again, it's another trade-off. We had quite... Those who know, know that that wasn't an easy decision, but a big trade-off around money versus performance gained. So we've passed Leeds, we've got a new Platform Zero in and commissioned, and now we move to the east of Leeds. So a different alliance is working on east of Leeds. We've got Volkers, Murphys and Siemens working together. Uh, Sistra are there as, our, as design partners. The biggest intervention we've just passed at Neville Hill. Neville Hill is a... It's the wrong place for a depot, uh, but just outside of uh, a major major station like Leeds. It eats capacity on that east side. But given the constraints that we've got, we, we've made improvements there to free up more capacity for passenger services running through, in, increase reliability. And the opportunity of moving the lines out to, to deliver a, a, a line speed increase, which Peter will talk about integration with NPR, is is out of interest to NPR as much as it is for, for TRU. In terms of integrating with others, uh, we've got AFA schemes which we're integrating with as we go through the route. And uh, we're now in the, coming through in towards York. And I'll say before we get there, we don't quite make it to York on this video, but the TRU programme does get there. And here we've yeah, we're just kind of on the approaches. And if you travel this journey today, you will see that some of those structures are now, are now in place. Now, all of that, 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 what you've just seen over the last five minutes is, is quite a nice visualization. But what I would say is, is that actually comes for free. We've, we've not spent a lot of time preparing that. I'd say, to, apart from the TWAO, where there's kind of a bit more detail in rendering, the rest of it comes out almost on the press of a button. And the, the reason we've been successful in doing that is working with Network Rail, who I think have, have shown quite a, a good vision and foresight to invest in what a, a, a digital connected ecosystem, as it says there, what that really can do for them. We've all heard about Orbis and kind of problems about kind of getting information out of Network Rail's different systems. 
what we've created on TRU as a, a, a lead-in, uh, a bit pre-investment, is a, as a concept of a digital warehouse. So that sits everything. Everything you need to know about assets sit within a digital warehouse. And we provide a window into it, which is like a Google Maps. Uh, it's uh, the uh, project mapper, as you can see on the front. Anybody can get it from their iPad, their iPhone. You can zoom in. You can interrogate all kinds of asset levels of detail. And the link in that we've got working with Bentley is that you can draw out any information on design, quantities of information, design progress, has that mass been in, where did the steel come from, it's all in now in one system, which is a, a transformation, really, in terms of how con connectivity and sharing information. Yeah, so as I say, <coughs> TRU is a uh, lot of challenges in finding that optimum balance in the development triangle. We haven't fixed everything. And my point here is you can't fix everything b before you start. There are... That's just not the way major programs can be developed. Problem is, if you, if you waited for everything to be fixed, you would never do anything. And you know, we, we know better than most the, the challenges that we get. So there are some, some issues that we have in freight is, again, post-COVID, I'd say freight has now got more important in terms of a, a requirement in the timetable. The and that affects the maintenance strategy. So some things you thought you've got nailed and solved have now actually moved back the other way and need to go back to the right again. But I think the key things we've, we have solved. Now, this uh, stolen off the internet, but this, this comes to my, my point. You know, I, I like this, really, because as engineers, we, quite, we sometimes struggle, struggle with this. Just starting the journey is more important sometimes than knowing where you're going to get to. And as, as I said, for TRU, we could quite easily, I, I could be talking here as, as this is TRU is just a PowerPoint and a promise of things to come. But what we've, what we've been able to do, we've built the confidence of, uh, of the DFT as funders. In all of the different scenarios that we've looked at, we've been able to isolate certain interventions and certain projects which just are true in, in, any, in any way that we look at it. So they've become our no regrets investments, and all of them, on their own, have a legacy benefit. Now, those benefits may not be as great as when we've done TRU as a whole, and in, term, in, in time, they won't be as great as when all of NPR is delivered as a whole. But it makes sense now, and it makes sense to make some progress and put investment in and start creating those legacy benefits. So on the timeline, what you can see there is the, the results of the 16-day blockade that happened at August. Um, two, bridge, two main bridges that went in, lots of track renewals, um, and, a, and a great first, first start and commendation for the, the True West team. And you know, Boris and Rishi were there yesterday looking at the progress so anything that creates a feel-good factor that the railways can deliver, and delivered this two hours early, so just, just as planned, within, the, you know, within time, within cost, reliable, that, that's the impression we need to give to the decision makers, that we can look after their investment safely so they can get a, the return that they expect. So the first of many time lapses for, for TRU. Now, it's not all been about the West. So on the East, as I say, we, if, if you go on the train, you'll see that they've been busy too. Lots of the OLE structures going up between uh, Colton and, and Micklefield just now, and the first of our East projects, E1. They're not quite as up with the production techniques, but uh, it's, it's still good to see. Um, production video, that is, not installing OLE. So just to, to recap, really, the TRU corridor, this, this, is what, this is what we do. We're encouraging the movement of people for economic growth, better access for resources for business, career growth. So that's individual and wider economy. And I, I know when I'm at the PWI, we like to talk about the, uh, I'll get this acronym wrong, but EMGPTA, 
But in the world of uh, stakeholders, they, they, don't, they didn't quite grab the tonnage concept. But what they did really grab hold of was the seats per hour, and that became quite a powerful way of talking about the loading on the assets. So we were at 700 seats an hour across the Pennines. The full timetable would have gone to 2,000. We go to 3,000. So the, putting those 3,000 seats in, one of the biggest challenges has been how does the tr existing track asset react to that? And that seems a very imprecise science and something we need to, to work on. But that's what we'll deliver as our legacy. Reduced journey times, the more trains, the safer journeys. And I will say one of our primary focus is also a safer railway for those who operate and maintain it. A key focus is how we get to those assets and maintain them. And that's my summary of where we are. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>